cap range was as we feel, at least back uh, when we first got here. They were in the southern part of New Hampshire, and the western part of New Hampshire, southern Vermont, and across, and it was the Lynx's country north of that. Uh, as the forest was cleared, as uh, Dennis was saying, when we stripped the land of, of all the trees, and, and one fact that a lot of people don't know, in 1900, New Hampshire was 90% to 95% deforested. It was nothing but fields. And animals do not live well in only fields. As the forest was cleared, the bobcat can uh, survive better in that environment than the lynx did, and the lynx was driven up uh, to the extreme north. Here you see uh, a female and a male lynx, uh, bobcat, I mean, and it shows you the difference in size. A female weighs not much more than a big house cat, 17 pounds is the average, and a male weigh up to 30 pounds. And actually, the record that New Hampshire has was in 1927, a 51 pound uh, bobcat was caught up in Indian Stream in Pittsburgh. So here you see the female and the male, and you can see the size difference between the two. This uh, shows a little on the coloration and how different it can be. They can actually have almost stripes to spots and to what you call rosettes uh, on the the uh, body itself. And this shows the color phases in these two hives that are on the ground here. They tend to be brown, darker brown in the summer, and they kind of turn to grayish in the winter time. <clears throat> this gives you, as I was saying before, some of those distinguishing characteristics. This shows the tail, as I said, the bobcat only has that black on the top of his tail. Uh, and it's wet underneath on the bottom of the tail. They have retractable claws that can be up to three quarters of an inch long. And the claws can be very dangerous even if you have killed a bobcat. If you're not wearing gloves, you can wind up getting yourself torn on, on those claws. They're retractable claws, like a house cat would have. Here it points out the ear tufts. Now they do have ear tufts, but you can notice they're very small, not like a lynx's. And they have these ear spots doesn't have, and this, they have a wide-faced ruff. It's, it's, uh, you can see it there. And then the bobcat track, if you happen to be out and you're uh, doing hiking or whatnot, or just uh, like to get out and, and try to find animal tracks, the track itself is kind of almost round, as you can see in the paw that bobcat there. You can see it in the track in the mud. And this shows you a little bit how to identify a bobcat track from a dog or a coyote track, which are very common to run into as well. The bobcat doesn't show any claw marks. When he walks, the claws are retracted. Coyote or dog, the, the uh, nails are out and exposed and show in the track. And with the bobcat, they're the interdigital pad is shaped like an M. And with a uh, dog or a coyote, it's kind of in a V shape. So that's the difference if you're trying to determine what that track is if you're out there looking. And the best place to find these kind of things may be on a dirt road this time of year when they're starting to thaw out, you'll find the tracks or along brooks and, and lake edges, you'll find these types of things. This shows a little about how to determine what the scat is if you're out there and you run into it. Uh, bobcat tends to be short, stocky, and the coyote tends to be long and drawn out. Kind of, uh, that's very interesting, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> what we thought you might want to know. <laughs> well, when you see it in the woods, you know what you're looking at. Yeah, right, right. I'm bush on the bottom of your shoe, though, so. <laughs> And this, uh, bobcats we find uh, have a number of different sounds. They growl, they can scream, and they have a scream that you won't forget. Uh, they can hiss, and they can push. And they're all used to communicate to basically other bobcats. With displeasure, with the fact that another male may have moved in on the territory, or a female moved in on another female's territory, and uh, hiss at each other. 
you know, animals, unlike humans, have learned to deal with uh, problems differently than us. If we don't like you, we shoot you or chop your head off. That's human nature. But animals don't. They, they, they posture and they make noises and they, and usually all disputes are settled amicably and the way goes the other uh, contender in the battle. So they use these things, these vocal communications, to tell other bobcat what they like, don't like, and to purr if they're happy with them. Although they don't spend much time together. Uh, the only time that you find a male bobcat around a female is in the breeding season. Their behavior, they're very solitary. Uh, somebody mentioned earlier tonight they've never seen a bobcat, and many people have never seen them. They're very, very hard to find. They're very territorial. They set up a territory that they live within and don't really change that as they go on. They're crepuscular, which means they're active mostly early mornings and at dusk, which is another reason you don't really see them. Uh, chance of seeing a bobcat is probably best if you're looking up all the time because they will stay up in the tree and be up there all day long, but you don't see them because you're not looking that way, you're looking down. The cat can lay there on the branch of a big tree and, and you will never know he's up there. Uh, the way they catch their, their prey is generally an ambush. They lay in wait, they lay on the branch of a tree and pounce on that, uh, the prey that they're uh, going to have for lunch. You find that the home ranges of the bobcat are different. Female has a smaller range than the male, and this just shows you that, that within a male's territory, there might be two females or even three that live within that male's territory, and sometimes that male may breed with all of those females. Uh, and the male doesn't stay around to earn a paycheck. That's it. He breeds and he's off to his territory to live the rest of the year. So this shows you that the, the ranges of the females are smaller and the male may encompass a number of them. They are sexually mature at two years old. Breeding season is February to March, uh, and a litter typically is two to four kittens. Uh, gestation, about 60 days, and the kittens are born in April through May. And the females only care for the young. Nobody else uh, provides any help. That's how lucky we guys are, see? We're just off on our way, right? <laughs> and there you see a group of kittens, and up there a mother with her kittens laying next to a wall. This slide a little bit uh, in detail. It shows how their diet, they find their diet. And, and all of these things are really to determine what the state needs to do to get get them in a better position. Uh, this shows back in 1951-54, they did a uh, biological test on uh, bodies of, uh, of, of dead bobcat. And they found, you see on the side is the percentage of food from deer, that was how, how much of their percentage, cottontail rabbits, and of course, this shows you how it changed in 61 to 65. You can see the balance change. Now, who's seen a cottontail rabbit? Put your hand up if you've seen a cottontail rabbit in the last 20 years. They're gone. Have you? Yeah. Where? Up on saddle back in Northwood. Is that right? Yeah. Well, the fish and game is doing quite an extensive uh, in reintroduction of cottontail rabbits in the coast. And some of them are, are getting out. But there aren't very many cottontail rabbits left in the state of New Hampshire, uh, unless they're in pens at the state has. So this shows you how their dietary changes uh, took place as different animals were eliminated from the opportunity for them to, to see them. You get to 79 to 81, deer had dropped down dramatically, cottontail rabbit was almost gone, and they were feeding on uh, the uh, hares, gray squirrels, part of it, and small mammals took over as the biggest percentage of their diet. And as uh, Dennis mentioned before, one of the things that's really come into play for Bobcat and provided them with a source of food is the turkey. Uh, that is a major source of their food now. And we have an abundance of turkeys, as you know. Uh, turkeys from New Hampshire introductions are all the way through the Brunswick now. Maine is <coughs> got a season, 
and they're all in New Hampshire. NASA is over with Turkey, and it's all with the success of New Hampshire's uh, honeymoon. A bobcat can live up to 10 years, but they don't really live that long in the wild. Five to six years is what we find is the uh, maximum for a wildcat in the, for a bobcat in the wild. Their teeth get worn and broken, and they're unable to uh, survive because they just can't catch this with prey. Uh, mortality, winter's especially hard on young bobcats. This winter must have been a, a, a terrible winter for them because we had so much snow. Small prey is difficult to capture when the snow is deep and hit and start. Uh, we found that in most cases, she may have four kittens, two will die before the winter. So 50% are lost just to weather related and to predation by other animals because there are other animals that will prey on them. They're small. One of the biggest things we found, the, the biggest loss of bobcats, is hyalas. They, they are strange, they don't stand back and watch the, they will stand back and watch the traffic and then all of a sudden dark in front of the headlights. Uh, most animals will back off when they see the headlights. Well, uh, bobcat don't. Bobcat will watch the traffic and then all of a sudden die out. And as you can see this one here didn't make it. The way they took that picture that the track the trail is parked in the outside lane, but anyway, he's standing by his truck. But uh, you can see there's a bobcat that's been killed. And find it as, well, if you get, it, get going along here, you'll find that in many areas that have highways like 93 and 101, the population of bobcats is very, very small in those areas because the highways take such a death toll on them. This uh, shows you that when the bounties were on it, that was another uh, unscientific way of uh, handling the thing. We didn't like an animal because it might have sometime uh, offended us for one reason. Well, put a bounty on them and kill them all, get rid of them. At one time, there were three cat species in New Hampshire. They were, did you all know what they were? Lynx, bobcat, and a mountain lion. Well, the mountain lion, my God, who would want a mountain lion around? So those were killed off. Uh, this shows the rise and fall of bobcat populations in New Hampshire is primarily due to changes in land use during the forest for agriculture, abandonment of those lands. As the forest grew back, the prey species like rabbits became abundant until the forest canopies uh, covered over those areas again, and then the small animals disappeared as the uh, undergrowth disappeared. And this shows you that the bounty was in effect from 1810 through 1830. You can see that graph. Then it was taken off in 1850, started back around 1910, taken off and then started in 1930 and you can see the uh, hundreds of bobcats that were taken uh, either by trapping or by uh, some of the needs and then it was taken off again and now they have started to come back. Uh, the research objectives which is the same with all of the objectives on wildlife restoration with the state is to, to really scientifically determine what we need to do to bring the animal populations back to where they should be. And in the past, we took guesses, we put bounties, we took bounties off, we did this, we did that. We, and we were just haphazardly making decisions which are today now being replaced by actual scientific studies because these monies that come back from the federal government on the taxes that the sportsmen pay goes to scientifically determined. The state of New Hampshire has many biologists, and they're only they a biologist for bear, and a biologist that deals with the bobcats. We have biologists that deal only with the streams and the rivers who test to make sure that we're providing good, clean water for fish. Uh, and that's their jobs, and that's paid for out of these funds that can come back from these programs uh, developed with the sportsman's dollars. Uh, so the research objectives with this program on Bobcat was to determine the current status, how many are there, how healthy are they, uh, compared with Bobcat populations in adjacent states, uh, and identify important habitat features, what they need to live on, what we need to help provide them with, and to identify potential wildlife corridors based on uh, 
uh, Bobcat movement for patterns. And that, uh, you'll see a little later, uh, it'll show you a picture, not a picture, but a, a map. They need, animals need a way to get from one area to another if they're going to grow their populations. And if it's blocked by superhighways and, and other uh, things that we put in their way, shopping centers and whatnot, uh, they have difficulty in expanding their territories. This shows you reported bobcat observations from the public. You may have seen that over the last few years in the papers. The fishing game was asked, anybody who saw a bobcat, please report it to me, because we're trying to determine where they were and how they were. And the information helps uh, just get a sense of how they responded to 20 years of protection. And the map compare, compares observations obtained from 1990 to 2004, which are the blue spots, and then the red spots are what was done uh, after that. Red was from 2008 to 2009. One thing that they've been surprised with, they didn't anticipate that they would see a population in the eastern part of the state. But that has really begun to show up and more, more indication of bobcat in the eastern side of the state than they had anticipated and even more than uh, sightings in the western part of the state. This shows you the first study that we did on actually trapping bobcats to find out their health. Uh, and it was done over in the western part of the state. Uh, you can see from the Mass border up through Allstead uh, and over through that area down, uh, actually almost along Route 9 coming down, going over the uh, Peterborough area. And what we did was live capturing bobcats. And here you see some of them that have been captured live. Uh, utilized trappers from the New Hampshire Trappers Association donated their time to go out to a live trap these animals. Uh, we used box traps, and the Trappers Association, personal traps we used, uh, and Vermont Fish and Wildlife also was involved in these tests. Here you see a uh, live capture in, in a uh, cage there. And after the body size and age are estimated, the bobcat's injected with an antibiotic and a sedative so that they can actually do examinations uh, without actually harming the cat. This shows you they weigh the cat, determine the gender, body measurements, the condition, uh, and record what those animals uh, have for health issues. And then a telemetry collar is attached so that we can track that bobcat through its next couple of years uh, of its life to determine where it travels and where it goes. Uh, it's a GPS collar. And here you see it attached to the uh, bobcat. And here you see one uh, where they're reversing the procedure and injecting them with a drug to bring them back. It takes 45 minutes to an hour to bring them back so that they can be released. And there you see one with his collar leaving the cage. And this gentleman here taking one out. He's got a lot of, uh, well, he's got his gloves on, so he's got already. Uh, this is, is kind of just some facts and figures of, this is the, the number that was given to those bobcats that were caught. Those are the dates they were tracked, the sex, male, female, whatever they were, and how much their weight was. Uh, and as you can see, it goes down to uh, 8.5 at, at the lowest. Uh, 16 is about the highest weight that they had. Uh, and the type of GPS collar, that's how they track them. Uh, it's different digital tracking. And then over in the township that it was actually tracked in. Uh, and again, in that keen western part of the state area, Harrisville, Nelson, Hancock, that's where we actually did the tracking. There were five juveniles who were captured, but not uh, caught. They were too small and, and wouldn't do that to them. Uh, this shows you the data as it's downloaded. I can tell you about that, but it just shows you that we are tracking. This shows you locations on the specific uh, numbered cats here. Uh, how many times we've got a fix uh, through a GPS on that particular cat. The first one, number 26, we got 919 hits of that cat's location. So they were able to 
to determine exactly what the ranges are in the territories. Uh, monetary, uh, monitoring is sometimes done in aerial uh, telemetry. Uh, aerial telemetry is kind of expensive, so they did uh, hire a company to actually get up in the air and do some telemetry testing on where they were, uh, trying to find out if they were dead or alive, wildcat locations, call a drop off, which sometimes happens, the call comes off. And uh, then after that, uh, the same company that was doing the air, air test for us uh, donated to Fishing Game uh, a number of other flights uh, on their own nickel to do it. Uh, Fishing Game was putting forth to keep going with the area. Call of recovery, here you see an unusual situation. There's a caller was recovered from a bobcat which was found dead in the water there. Uh, the collars are set so that after so many hours of no activity, the collar sends back a signal saying the cat is dead. So then they have to go in and try to find the collar. And this product wound up finding the cat, the, the, the bobcat had dropped into the water, uh, but they trapped him with an antenna to get the signal, and uh, he found the cat in the water. Uh, this is GPS caller data, shows you uh, how many times they got certain hits from certain uh, Bobcat. And each, each little dot is, is when they recorded a hit, that's where that cat was. And again, the cat stayed in pretty much that same area. And I don't know if you noticed in the trapping towns, but there were very few trapped in that lower section, they were mostly trapped in the upper section of, of the towns. Uh, this shows you the home range size. It shows you before that the male and female overlap and more females than uh, have a smaller territory. This shows you that there was a female had an 11 mile territory that, that was hers, uh, a male with a 22 mile uh, square mile territory, and another male over here with a much larger territory, that is a 40 mile territory. The average we found for a male for his territory is about 36 square miles. And the female average is about 11 miles for her territory. And they move based on the seasons. Uh, the, the home seasonal range, winter you see in the purple. In the spring it expands greatly, and in the fall it begins to contract as they move back to their winter. And the reason for that is you can see this is a actual photograph of that same area. They tend to stay particularly in uh, areas where it's lowlands. So there are much more in the way of uh, wildlife for them to, to actually catch as, as predators in lowlands, along swamps and rivers and brooks, uh, lakesides. Those type of areas are much more productive for them in what they're able to eat then you can see up, up in the forest in heavy areas. There's not a lot of uh, small game for them to catch in those areas. And this shows you the same thing done in the Jupiter, which comes from the satellite. And this summer fall, they tend to head for the agricultural fields because along the edges of the fields, corn fields, you have a lot of young growth coming up, which draws a lot of mice, and you get a lot of if there are any rabbits uh, be in areas like that, birds, turkeys, uh, feeding in the fields. So you find that, as you can see the hits there, they all tend to be along farmland areas where they have a better opportunity to catch small game. This again shows different territories for different uh, bobcats. This was a male, uh, and this was his territory in the winter. In the summer, you can see where it moved to those blue areas, along the field areas and along the river over there. This uh, just shows you again territories. This is a uh, particular male number 30. Uh, he was on the north of Route 9, uh, and then one on Route 101 south, and that was his territory. But the highways wind up eliminating a lot of the, the population. This shows you how many territorial bobcats were fit, or we felt fit, in the study area. 
We use average home range size estimates adjusting for home range overlap and initial estimate of the study areas. 22 males and 67 females were in that area that we tested. Uh, we asked the state wide uh, estimate of bobcats in the fall, in the winter, we feel there are about 1,400 within the state. In the spring and the summer, is 2,200 is the estimated population. And that's much higher because, as I mentioned, half of the, the young kittens uh, die by the time winter gets here. And they die for many of those reasons. So, but uh, it's, it's a big drop off naturally. Matter of fact, if you follow in the papers, there's stories of fish and game. They're now considering opening the season again. Uh, just what that would be and what it would entail, uh, we don't know. Uh, we just get the effort, uh, but uh, they are talking of possibly opening the season on them in certain areas. Uh, where they are, you know. But uh, that's that's a proposal. But maybe after this winter, which had to be terrible, and then they may change their mind because they may find out come in the summer there aren't nearly as many now as we thought we had because of this bad winter. Uh, habitat suitability models. Uh, Previous models of broadcast habitat suitability were based on incidental observations, which is said uh, people made a decision based on what they thought, not what they knew or what the, the actual facts were. Uh, topography, road density, and annual snowfall were important predictors. Now we actually catch the, the fish. That is really well, wonderful. Uh, saying, we, by the seat of our pants, this is what we thought was the situation with Bobcats, that they were all pretty much centered in the western part of the state. And this shows you what we felt were areas that they could live in. Uh, the white areas were determined that that wouldn't support Bobcats. Uh, the brown was their primary, and the yellow was uh, an area that they thought uh, was, was still suitable. The white areas, particularly in North Country, are the high ground, and bobcats really don't like high ground. There's nothing much up there for them to eat. They're looking for low ground where there are a lot of smaller animals and that type of situation. And I talked to you before about corridors, or mentioned corridors. This shows is a corridor for wildlife, uh, bobcats and other wildlife as well, which encompasses two million acres. And it runs from Quabbin in Massachusetts, Quabbin Reservoir north through Cardiff. And that area, because it's still not densely populated, there aren't shopping centers on every corner, and people put in shopping centers and deer yards and that type of thing, that animals can freely move up and down the western part of the state. And that is considered uh, a very, very important wildlife corridor uh, so that animals can move and expand their territories. So if you lock them in with Four lane superhighways, uh, they, they just don't survive. Very interesting thing if you go to Canada, you go to New Brunswick. They have these, everything's fenced. 
The deer can't get on the highway anymore. But there are, they put tunnels for them underneath the highway so that the deer can pass and forth and, and make corridors for them. Uh, here, wildlife is really a, a secondary thought for most people. But a healthy wildlife population, a healthy water population, a healthy fish is healthy for human beings. We won't survive once we turn the land into real problems. This shows you we did another study in 2010, 2011. And this is where we found that that habitat that we, by the seat of our pants, said wouldn't support the bobcats actually is. And it shows you from Nottingham, Deerfield, all the way up through uh, Gilmanton to Gilpin. There is a very, very sustainable bobcat population in that area of the state. And you can see it outlined on the right, and then the, the blue pie is the uh, survey that we did the years before that. So we're finding that there are areas that are supporting bobcat populations. And the additional steps that they're taking from these uh, tests that we're doing, uh, we do a lot of genetic lab testing. Uh, once you box in animals into a particular area, and they keep interbreeding, then you wind up with problems in the breed. And what they're trying to determine, is there enough diversity? Are the animals spreading out enough that the breeding is not so much in it? You see that in breeding of dogs. You know, you inbreed them too long, you have real problems. So incorporated in the study uh, were the satellite models doing the testing, doing the hits uh, from there to test. Uh, camera trap studies uh, in Barrington uh, and other locations in that area where they could actually trap some of these bobcat over there in that part of the state. And they found that they do have a viable population in the eastern side of the state as well. Uh, we talked before about other cat species. They suddenly have found, we thought that that lynx were completely extirpated from New Hampshire. Uh, but in, two years ago, they did find a breeding pair in Pittsburgh who had four kittens. So we feel that maybe the lynx may move back in uh, as well, because there are lynx in Maine. Maine has a considerable population, and of course, Quebec and New Brunswick do. So we're hoping that we would see that same growth in links coming back into the state of New Hampshire. Probably we'll never see them down here because they and they don't mix well with bobcats. But uh, there, there are some links coming back. And here you see some pictures that were taken by just people uh, out walking around the house of bobcats that were called. You can see the collars. Here's one that was in somebody's backyard. They look like a couple of them up in the top were in someone's backyard. But uh, Fish and Game had advertised, if you see a bobcat, let us know. So these were pictures that were taken by people who did see them when they were out hiking or walking in the snow or uh, just in, in backyards. And that is what we're doing with these monies to try to restore wildlife uh, to its former glory in New Hampshire. We have some great opportunities and we have some uh, people who work awfully hard at Fish and Game to, to try to do it. Everybody thinks of Fish and Game is the warden who tells you you get too many fish and you get uh, a ticket for it. But a great, the greatest percentage of Fish and Game's uh, actual efforts are put into the wildlife's population and growth and trying to keep it healthy, trying to keep the land healthy and the rivers and the brooks and whatnot. So it's a, it's a very, very strong effort, and it's all paid for with sportsmen's dollars and fish beds, fishermen and hunters, because that's where these taxes uh, go from those groups. So that's really all we have. Unless you have, anybody got any questions, uh, we probably don't have the right answer, but we'll give you a snappy one. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that somebody has seen a, a bobcat in the Maine River, and there's always reports of people seeing mountain lions. The fishing game says they will not corroborate that there are mountain lions until somebody comes in with a mountain lion. There could be, there was a, a mountain lion killed in Massachusetts, in Western Mass, and it was traced through DNA that that uh, actually came from the Dakotas. That animal traveled, they feel, through Canada, 
and then came back down to the, the, the States and wound up uh, being hit by a, a vehicle uh, on the Mass Turnpike. It was not only killed in Connecticut, which came from the, the Midwest. What drives them to suddenly leave where they are and travel 2,000 miles? No one really knows, but uh, not in New Hampshire. They haven't caught one yet. But she was first. Okay. Um, the radio callers, do those just stay on the whole line? Well, they eventually drop they eventually off. off. Yeah, they're made to, to drop off so that they, you know, the batteries only last maybe a couple of years and then the, the collar drops oh. off. And the studies are like two year studies that we do uh, to get that information. Yes, sir. Uh, three years ago, I was coming back from uh, the Adirondacks to Vermont on Route 4, just west of Rutland. Right. And uh, my wife and I saw a, a mountain lion. And we confirmed it with the uh, fish and game in the state of Vermont. They admitted they, 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 they had confirmed that there were additional sightings of that same animal. Okay. Uh, they did say, however, that it was more than likely either a pet or had come down from some other state. Well, that's what they always say. That's what New Hampshire says. If you see one, it's probably uh, a pet that's escaped. Uh, but yet the only two in New England in recent history, that, and that, those are recent, that were found were actually wild mountain lions from the Midwest that somehow had traveled that great distance here. So I, mean, I, didn't, I saw what I thought was a mountain lion too, but... Uh, this was about six feet long. Yeah. Tail was about this long. And this thing was moving about 40 miles an hour. Oh, it was moving. Yeah. It would be wonderful. <laughs> it would be wonderful to see them back. Actually, it would. You know, they, they deserve a place to live. Anybody else get in? That's it. Did you, did you give up the prize? Yeah. Uh, the online is, it, it is a big question. I've got some slides over here that doesn't have in his. About sightings of mountain lions in the state, and you know what, most of them have all been proved to be false. They were the big house cats, or they were, in one case, somebody had a taxidermed 